You know, June can be a little bit slow as we approach that August and September start to the college football season. So I'd say it's time for the very first edition of the Big Ten Ted Mailbag. The community came in big with some really good topics and some really good talking points. Let's get into it. From L.A. to Piscataway, all Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten Ted. Before we get into the mailbag questions for this edition, always tweet at Big Ten Ted on Twitter, Big Ten Ted at gmail.com. YouTube comments, always feel free to give me questions. Always feel free to give me topics. Gives me more ideas and more possible content to put towards you. And I'll always cover what you guys, what the fan, what the Big Ten Ted fan really wants out there. All right, let's dive in to the mailbag. I want to start first with George Paul Lewis over there on Twitter. He's amazing blue backer. Will Michigan be repeat national champions? To really answer that question, you got to take a look at the question with a microscope. And there's one word in there that really determines which way I want to go with the answer of the question. He asked, will they repeat as the national champions? Not can they repeat as the national champions? Michigan certainly can repeat as the leaders at the top of the mountain of the college football world. You look, they have one of, if not the best defense in all of college football. They have a great weapon at tight end in Colston Loveland. They have a great running back in Donovan Edwards, who's on the cover of the college football 25 video game and could be one of the best backs in all of college football. They certainly have the pieces and they have that DNA that we know works winning Big Ten championships. And of course, last year, 15-0 national championship. But I'm going to lean towards no answering the question, will they repeat as the national champions? And I'm going to tell you why here, Mr. Lewis. It starts with the quarterback position for me because I believe we're getting more towards an NFL style of play in college football in many different ways, both off the field and between the lines on Saturdays. And in one of those respects, I think you got to have a quarterback now to make that run through the regular season and now to make that run through multiple rounds of the college football playoff. Last year, we talked about that Michigan DNA, offensive line, defense, run game, all that stuff. They had it. But they also had the quarterback in J.J. McCarthy that could make big throws when they needed to be made. They had the quarterback that could make the plays. Now, they didn't ask him to make as many plays as, say, Bo Nix or Michael Penix or maybe some of these other quarterbacks that led the country in some of these statistical categories. But J.J. McCarthy was still pretty good. Look at that Alabama game and those throws that he was able to make. It was his arm. It was his decision-making That won Michigan a national championship, got them past Alabama and into that championship game against the University of Washington. When I look at Michigan at the quarterback position, Alex Orgy, Davis Warren, Jack Tuttle, no matter who you're throwing out there, the way I look at it right now as I'm sitting here in June, days away from my fifth wedding anniversary, I just don't know if I see it at the quarterback position. I don't know if I see that talent. I look around at other quarterbacks on other of the championship contenders, and I see why people view those teams as championship contenders. Carson Beck at Georgia, Dylan Gabriel over there at Oregon, Quinn Ewers at Texas. And of course, to win a national title, you need to get into a 12-team college football playoff. If Michigan does not win the Big Ten title and get that automatic berth, you essentially need to be a top 10 team at the end of the year. Okay, because the group of five really takes away one spot. There's a chance that a Big 12 team could be a bid stealer outside of the top 12 as well if they all kind of beat up on each other. The good teams like Utah, Arizona, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, right? They all kind of beat each other. That could possibly happen uh, as well in the Big 12. So that's why you got to get into the, uh, the top 10 in the country. And when I look at Michigan's schedule, Like, you look at, they play three college football playoff contenders, probably national championship contenders, right? That early season game, Big Noon, against Texas at the Big House. They play Oregon at the Big House. That's going to help them that they get two of the three games 
in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then they got to go on the road to Columbus to play one of the most talented team, maybe the most talented team in college football in their arch rival in the Ohio State Buckeyes. So I think that they could win one of those games, especially one of the two games at home versus Texas or versus Oregon. And they're going to need to get into the playoff. But right now, if I'm comparing these teams on paper, I'm probably taking Texas, Oregon, and Ohio State right now, talent-wise, over what we see at Michigan. I know the DNA and I know the formula works at Michigan, but that's just kind of the way I feel of it right now. If this is a 9-3 and three team, and that's chalk holds, and they're 9-3 they're and three at the end of the year, you need USC to be good, right? Because you play them at home uh, early in the year. Maybe Washington is somewhere around 8-4, and four, and they're towards the bottom of the top 25, where that's still a ranked win. Maybe Minnesota surprises some people. You know, you need a little bit more in terms of those quality wins that strength the schedule from other parts of your schedule right now. So there's a chance that Michigan could be on the outside looking in because of all of the things they lost and because of those great opponents um, on their schedule as well. Let's move on and let's talk about another question. This from our guy Kent Peterson, also known as Casual Big Ten over there on Twitter. He asks, ceiling and floor for Purdue wins. They were hard for me to figure out last year, and I'm back in the same predicament this year. Of course, last year was the very first year that Ryan Walters was the head coach of the Boilermakers. The Golden Black went 4-8 and eight in his inaugural campaign at Purdue. Now, when we're looking at the floor and the ceiling, of course, we're looking at the schedule. Of course, we're looking at wins and losses. And for the second consecutive year, <laughs> schedule makers didn't do Purdue any favors because there are four games right off the top that I just don't know if I see Purdue winning unless we see the spoiler makers rise up like a phoenix. Those four games, home against Notre Dame early in the year, Home against Oregon. Now, that's a Friday night after the Ducks play Ohio State. I've said publicly that that could be the reappearance of the spoiler maker. So just watch out for that one, even though Oregon is a much more talented team. At Ohio State and versus Penn State, when you take a look at those four big teams, they play three of them. Now, Purdue has some pieces on their team. You look at Hudson Carter, quarterback. You look at Devin Mockaby uh, in the backfield, if he can get, get back to his form from a couple of years back. The defense, right? We know that's Ryan Walter's specialty, right? He made a big jump in year number two at Illinois. Can they do the same at Purdue? You look at a freshman All-American like Dylan Thieneman back there at safety. You look at Kydron Jenkins, who's a good player, who's going to be playing linebacker. You look at Yanni Karloftis. Like, they got pieces but what about the team as a whole? Can everything gel together? Because there's been a lot of transfers. There's been a lot of moving parts here with the Boilermakers. So if they don't win any of those four games, and I'm not predicting them right now to win any of those four games, that's eight and four. Now, outside of those four games, at Wisconsin, Purdue just doesn't beat the Badgers. It just doesn't happen. And they got to go on the road to Madison. And then they play Nebraska as well. Though Both of those teams should be pretty good football teams as well. So because of all of that, I just can't put the ceiling for the Boilermakers higher than seven and five. I think seven and five with this schedule would be a pretty darn good year for the Boilermakers. Making a three game jump from four and eight to seven and five. That's a victory in West Lafayette, Indiana. I could see this Purdue team standing somewhere between six and six, seven and five. Maybe they upset one of the big boys, but then you also have to imagine what happens in their rivalry games? They still got Illinois on the schedule. They still got Indiana on the schedule. We know in Big Ten rivalry trophy games, anything can happen. So I just find it very difficult. No matter what happens in those big four games and then you trickle down the schedule, it's just very difficult for me to imagine this being an eight-win team. That's why I put the ceiling sitting there at seven regular season wins. And then the floor... You know, they've got winnable games. Indiana State, uh, Oregon State uh, are on the schedule. So I feel pretty confident in those games. And then you add a third in there as well. I just don't see them dropping to a bad type of record, like 2-10. and 10. I just I don't foresee that happening. I think there's too much talent on this Purdue roster to go 2-10. and 10. That's why I set the floor at 3-9. and nine. Staying inside the state of Indiana for our next Mailbag question. This from T.P. Hammock over there on Twitter. 
Is Indiana a dark horse team to watch this season? Absolutely. I covered it in my pod and show last week when talking about who could be some surprise teams, who could be a team that could shock us in the Big Ten this season. I mentioned Kurt Signetti and the Indiana Hoosiers. I love the confidence and the jolt of lightning that Kurt Signetti has brought to this Indiana program. I like what he's done saying, we're going to invest in football. We're going to take the football profile and take it up a few notches here in the state of Indiana at, in, at the University of Indiana. So, And then you look at what he was able to do, bringing in this roster, flipping this roster. Like You can't look at last year and try to use that as a blueprint because it's completely different. Right When you have 30-plus transfers in, you have 30-plus transfers out of this program in the offseason. It's a completely new team. And I think he has shaped this team in his image. He's bringing over a lot of really good players from JMU, right? Highly graded defensive back. So you look at some of these players that he brought in on the defensive line from JMU. How about CJ West, the defensive tackle coming over from Kent State? Wisconsin really wanted him up front. They won a lot of these battles. He's talked about the NIL investment from the university is more than he originally thought it would be. So that is certainly a good sign for Indiana. Their schedule early in the year is favorable. So I think for them to surprise and be that dark horse, maybe get to bowl eligibility, they're going to need to win some of these games early in the schedule. It gets a little bit tougher in the back end of the schedule, but I'm looking at Indiana, and that could certainly be a team that could surprise some people in 2024. Let's move on to John Kottmeyer over there on Twitter. He's asking about... The Wisconsin Badgers, he's tugging at my heartstrings a little bit with this one. Will Wisconsin upset Alabama, USC, Penn State, or Oregon? So can they beat one of those teams? Here's what I want to start with. I kind of want to start in chronological order. I've been saying this for the last couple of months. If you're going to get Alabama, get them the year after Nick Saban retires, and get them at home, get them at your place. Wisconsin is in a great situation taking on the Alabama Crimson Tide early in the season because Kalen DeBoer, I really like Kalen as a coach. I think he's one of the best head coaches in the country. But Kalen DeBoer could still be figuring things out. Can Jalen Milrow adjust to the type of offense that Kalen wants to run if maybe the transition isn't as seamless? Maybe guys like Hunter Wohler? And the interception machine, Ricardo Holman, can take advantage of that and really force some turnovers and put this Wisconsin offense into an advantageous situation. Now, people are looking at Alabama as a playoff team, so that is a tremendous opportunity. I think people are overlooking Wisconsin a little bit, right? What they've been the last couple of years, maybe they're not the Wisconsin of old. This is an opportunity for the the Badgers to remind people, yeah, we still got that W on the side of your helmet. Right, We still got a couple of Heisman Trophy winners in our history. We are still the Wisconsin Badgers. Now, if I look at any of these four and I say, which one is the highest probability that they can pull that upset? It's probably USC. It's probably the one game that they have on the road. And I'd be curious when they match up exactly who is the favorite on that one because there is a chance that that might not even be an upset for Wisconsin to go into the Coliseum and defeat uh, the USC Trojans. But It plays into their favor that they get three of these football games at Camp Randall Stadium. That's really going to help Wisconsin. Now, in order for them to play at this high of a level, in order for them to be able to defeat some of these football teams, right, that defense has to take that step up. And I believe it can. You know, the run game has to be there. Chesmalusi has got to stay healthy. That has not happened, right? But the big thing is Tyler Van Dyke. We need Rhett Lashley-era Tyler Van Dyke instead of Josh Gaddis-era Tyler Van Dyke, the offensive coordinators over there at the University of Miami. That's what we need. If Tyler Van Dyke is confident, if he is slinging it in Phil Longo's offense, this offense is going to be a lot better. We go from one great college town to another. How about Madison, Wisconsin to State College, Pennsylvania? Let's head to Happy Valley. This from... Nittany Nation 63 on Twitter. Will Penn State finally get over the hump and hit 11 wins? Additionally, your final thoughts on the whiteout game. Man, all Penn State does 
is win 10 games. They've been at that level, but when Nittany Nation 63 talks about getting over the hump, it's about winning some of those big football games. Now, they only have Ohio State on their schedule. When you talk about Michigan and Ohio State, those teams that they haven't really been able to beat since 2016 on their schedule. And they get the Ohio State Buckeyes at home in front of that raucous crowd at Beaver Stadium. When I look at this football team that's returning, specifically on offense, they have the pieces to make that significant jump this season. And they have the schedule that plays into their favor as well. When I look at this team making that jump and being significantly better, my eyes drift towards Andy Kotelnicki. The new offensive coordinator comes over from Kansas. They've been able to put up some big numbers in the Big 12 with Jalen Daniels and company uh, the last couple of seasons. And I'm very confident that he can take this talent. I think they might have more talent at Penn State than they had at Kansas. He can take that talent and he can make it maybe one of the Big Ten's best offenses in 2024. We know Drew Aller is a very talented quarterback. Like what he was able to do in year number one, I know a lot of people bag on him a little bit, but he protected the football. He threw a lot of touchdowns. I think he put Penn State in, a, in position to win a, a lot of football games, which is encouraging. And then you look at the wide receiver position. That was a big level of concern for Penn State. Basically, you, you make a trade, right? You lose Keandre Lambert-Smith, but you bring in Julian Fleming, who I think stretched the field for Ohio State. And I think he can stretch the field with the deep ball down the field for the Penn State Nittany Lions, but you still got the Harrison Wallaces of the world. You still got the Liam Cliffords of the world. You still got the Caden Saunders of the world still in this wide receiver room. So you're going to need some of those other guys to step up into this offense, but I have a feeling that Andy Kotonicki is going to scheme some things up. He's going to be creative. He's a very creative play caller. I think he's going to put this offense in good position. You know what? I haven't even mentioned one of the best running back duos in the country, Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. Like, Nick Singleton a couple of years back was extremely explosive. We know what Katron can do between the tackles. But I think for Penn State to really take that next step, that next step up and get to that 11 wins that was asked in this question, Nick Singleton's got to be that dude. He's got to be that explosive weapon. And I think for Nick to make those big plays, he needs the pass game as a threat, especially the deep pass game, so some of those run lanes can get open so not as many defenders are stacking the box in the middle. I love this defense uh, on that side for the Penn State Nittany Lions. They might have the best pass rush duo in college football. Abdul Carter is going to be insanity coming off the edge, right? An all-Big Ten linebacker, you move him to edge, they're fine, they're fine. Danny Dennis Sutton uh, on the other side. Look, you lose Adisa Isaac. You lose Top Robinson, and you're just right back where you started with a really good pass rush over there as well. They feel really good about their linebackers that replaced uh, Abdul Carter. You look at the Kobe Kings. You look at the Dominic DeLuca. How about Tony Rojas, who they're really excited to step in uh, to this role and continue that linebacker U, uh, tradition. They've got some really good safeties back there. So I feel confident that Penn State, Penn State is maybe a team that not a lot of people are talking about right now. But they could very well be sitting there at 11-1. and one. They could very well be sitting there at 10-2. and two. I see Penn State as a playoff team. Now the whiteout. Here's what I will say about the whiteout. You know, with certain games throughout the college football calendar, they're almost locked in to a time slot. Michigan and Ohio State, we know that game is going to be on Fox every year. We know it's going to be at noon on every year. Well, prior to this year, I guess, Texas and Oklahoma was also one of those noon games, but ESPN is playing that in the mid-afternoon slot, which I guess maybe goes in the contrary to what I'm trying to say. But here's what I will say. I wish Penn State, NBC, and the Big Ten Conference could really get together and say it maximizes our TV product, it maximizes our television value to make the whiteout game one of the biggest games of the college football season. I wish at the beginning of the year, the Big Ten, Penn State and NBC could all say, all right, we're going to pick, we're going to let Penn State and NBC work together to pick what they view as their best home game, what they want as the whiteout, and that's going to be a primetime game on NBC. For example, this year it would be Ohio State. Now I know that is early in November. Penn State has been one of those schools that has shied away from playing night games 
in November, but I think that goes into effect with the conference and how they schedule things as well. So I would just like to see that because this is one of the best aesthetics. It is one of the best, best television products in college football. NBC is paying a lot of money. I just want to see the whiteout at its full potential. Ohio State, Michigan, USC, Oregon, types of games like that the last few years. Minnesota was a lopsided game. Iowa, a little bit better, but still a lopsided game in the rain. This year, it's looking like it's going to be the Illinois game as well. Like, we got to have the whiteout in a prime, must-see type of atmosphere, must-see type of football game, and you need it against those bigger brands. Isn't what that what the... Isn't that what television networks coming in and controlling the product is all about? Putting these big brands against each other in these big time time slots? That's at least how I see it. We're going to finish things off on a comment on YouTube from A1 Googler. 18 teams, possibly 20 or 24 in the future. Currently, minus the 2024 season, the Big Ten has the best scheduling system in comparison to the SEC. The ACC and other conferences, all teams play each other within two to three years. Come 2024 and beyond, all that could change. What should and can be done to keep us as a conference and not just a collection of business partners so we continue to play all members within three years? Expanded regular season, 13 games, 14 games. We're not adding regular season games. That's just not happening, right? Because you add more regular season games, you've already added... A lot of playoff games, you're getting to way too many games. You're getting close to 20 games. That's like a half more season than they were playing uh, just just a little bit ago. So I just don't foresee that happening. Regular season is going to stand pat at 12 teams. Look, you got to get used to playing your couple of rivals. And then you're, you might not play some other teams in the conference for four or five years. I mentioned at the beginning of this show in terms of something else that we're venturing more towards an NFL model and in terms of scheduling, I think it's like that as well. I think you are going to play your rivals. You're going to play maybe as we continue to expand in the conference, whether it's divisions or whether it's not divisions, I think you could see more protected rivalries. For example, if you're a Purdue fan, right, your protected rivalries right now, you play Illinois in the Cannon game, you play the old Oak and Bucket game, against Indiana. Maybe you start to protect Northwestern. Maybe you start to protect uh, Michigan State and Wisconsin and Minnesota and maybe some of those other games. And then you're just not playing the West Coast teams as much. Maybe you're not playing those Southeast teams, Florida State, Clemson, Miami, if they're, they come into the conference as well. I just think you're going to have a group of teams that you play more often and that group could expand from where it's at right now. We are going to get in a situation where you might not play a team in your conference for four years and five years, what we viewed as a conference even like 10 years ago, even in the 12-team Big Ten, it's not the same, right? Where you were at max not playing a team every two years, every three years, something like that. Like, it's going to be a longer period of time the more teams that you add to this conference. So once again, in many different ways, we are going to an NFL type of model. And I think if you're a school, and then I think if you're the Big Ten Conference, I'm going to keep using Purdue as this example. Like, you're going to want to play on the West Coast. You're going to want that tie with recruiting. You're going to want to play in the Southeast part of the country. So you might be sacrificing your game against the Iowa Hawkeyes. You might be sacrificing your game against maybe some of these teams within your region as well to get to other parts of the country to play a truly nationwide type of schedule. I tell you what, this was a lot of fun. Let's do it again sometime. I'm Big Ten Ted. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching Big Ten Ted, where it's all Big Ten all year long. Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.